All right, there we are. Just hit the record button. Libations. Yeah. Oh, I got to grab a glass here. I'm, I'm not prepared. I've brought all kinds of beverages out. Some little show and tell of, of a few different items. Taste and share. Welcome, everyone. Yeah. All right, Gene says minus 38, cold and chilly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, hello, Dr. Fiona. Great. Okay. Minus 38. How's everybody doing this warm and cold winter day? I hope you're keeping warm. You got a fire, you're frosty, getting outside. I know my car didn't start this morning. I've got this. Oh, see if it's. Mmm. Mmm. I decided to crack our Labrador tea mead. Oh. A while back. I know I've been saving this. You know, when you get down to the last bottle, last like two bottles, and you're like, don't ever want to open that one. It's so good. <laughs> For well, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got a Labrador tea uh, sizer that I made here. All right. Yeah. So I don't know which one we're going to crack first. Well, it sounds like we should go visit Yarrow and raid his hobbit hole, right? Well, right. Go this is the thing about making mead is that you need a, a hobbit cellar to store it in. Right. And um, just uh, for those of you who are joining us live in the chat, let us know where you're coming from. Uh, what's your favorite drink? What is your favorite thing to um, pour libations to? This is the season, you know, maybe, maybe you're drinking it now, maybe you're not, but what is your favorite drink? Is it, is it eggnog? We were talking last night about feeding our fruitcake booze and then eating that, eating a booze cake. Um, but, you know, this isn't pre-warning, like we will talk a little more about this, but um, this isn't just about getting drunk. This is actually about medicine and how we can craft medicine out of herbs using the spirits to help uh, accentuate their uh, their beautiful bouquet and bring them into our bodies in a, in a more inspirited, empowered, impassioned way. So that, this is such a great question, Yaro. Um, as far as it goes, like, what is your favorite thing to drink in the winter time? Well, for me, I don't know. It's exactly what I've got here in my bottle. Let's see. Can we get a shot of this pouring there, Malcolm? Okay. Oh, mason jar pour. So. Okay. Can you want to say? Uh... Oh yeah. So what do I have here? Very special. Like a glass um, horn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's what, it's about what's in the horn that's. Uh... <laughs> it's about what's in the horn that's special. So this is um, Calgary grapes. Mead. So Calgary grapes from my parents' garden. That it's from my parents' garden, and uh, uh, yeah, I turn into a mead, and you know that's one of the greatest benefits I've found through fermentation of my own beverages is, you know, capturing the moment that's special, capturing this grape like harvesting these grapes in the summer sun was one of the best moments of my life so far and it's in this glass right now this is like captured that moment so when we drink that then oh. cheers to it we're we are transported to that moment in time and mm. calgary grapes at that I mean, I didn't know Calgary could grow grapes, but. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got grapes growing in my backyard, uh, for sure. You know, they're, they're different. I'm, I would wager that yours are probably plumper and sweeter and, and that kind of thing, but. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, this is, this is a mead because I added honey and uh, I added honey to it, but you know, uh, yeah, when I drink this, in the coldest, darkest nights of winter, yeah, it makes me happy, right? Because I'm <laughs> transported to that moment where I was in the in my garden in the sunshine, and it's it's mood elevating. I'm 
I'm not sure how others would feel when they drink this, but yeah. Yeah, you, you speak to something there, Denny, that is really important. It's the, the like, what happens in the crafting of it that stays with the beverage, that brings that like vivid imagery when you taste it, when you smell it, you know, that whole alchemy of the process of the loving harvest of uh, every piece along the way, that one sip brings all of that flooding in. And that's that's one of the beauties of, of brewing your own um, anything, crafting your own anything, whether it's herbal medicine, whether it's beverages like this, there's really that experiential depth that you just can't find from anything bought in the store. Totally. And, and I would say, you know, for those items that are bought in the store, they're, I think that's maybe one of the reasons that we're drawn to certain brands, you know, like it could be the terroir, it could be the, the environment, mm. you know, that the grapes or the apples or whatever it is that was grown in. But there's also that story of, you know, the, the craftsman or the craftswoman, the, you know, the, the alewife or whoever it was that brewed that beverage, you know, like them themselves becomes kind of imbued into that beverage. And I, I think that's a part of uh, the draw that we all have to certain brands as well, if, if we're buying it, you know, the story. Yeah. All right. all right. Well, it looks like we've got people drinking mead and more wine. Uh, we've got people from Calgary, Red Deer, Toronto, uh, coming from all over from Dawson Creek, enjoying my raspberry mead. Nice. Cochrane, favorite gin, hot mulled wine, um, a bunch of different good beverages. Ooh, tequila and bee propolis. You guys are already seasoned, um, we'll say mocktail, cocktail um, extraordinaires. Yeah. Yeah. Can we do that though? Yeah. Okay, sorry, we're just chatting amongst ourselves here, but uh, it's cool. Really great to have everybody on the call tonight. You it's know, true when you, it's true when you go to the liquor store, is there anything that is not botanical medicine? That's a good question. You know, you can get your is. herbal spirits. <laughs> you can get your, everything comes from a plant though, except maybe Mongolian horse milk alcohol. <laughs> but if you think about it, every beer, that's, that's one of the things that astounds people so many people don't realize beer comes from sprouted grains and that's mm. you know a herb really beer grains are a herb yeah when you look at the beer though too often at least in england and in places like that it's all about the spring like the water is a really big part of it too right like the grains but also the water and the alchemy of that and something i, I think spirits and any liquid in general can is infusing water into our body in some form. And so what is the vibration of that too? Are we changing it through the, 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 the microbiotics that are, are brewing in there? Are we starting with beautiful spring water? Where is that coming from? Um, all that has a lot to be part of that story. So one of the problems I find myself anyway, with, with some distilled alcohols is that a lot of that has been totally taken out of it and it's sort of displaced. I really love fermentation for that process of just capturing and holding and alchemizing the water in that way. And honestly, honestly, that's where all of this started, really. If we look in medieval ages, fermentation, of course, was a way to make water safe to drink. So basically, we evolved as humans drinking fermented beverages just to, you know, fermentation makes the water free of all pathogens, really. The, that's, that's, that's a huge, drink beer. huge thing, right? Yeah, and so the other thing there too, you know, the origins of civilization, you know, we settled down. So the theory goes, you know, being hunter-gatherers to actually uh, being in one place so we could grow grain, <laughs> harvest it, store it, ferment it. Uh, turn it into beer. So, you know, the origins of, of civilization is intertwined with fermentation, but that particularly of uh, grains and, and beer. Uh, and back at that time, beer was described as liquid bread and bread was described as beer. solid beer. Bread. Beer bread. Beer bread. All right. So I think we got enough people online already. We can get we can get started. Well, um, I want to just do a little quick housekeeping. First off, it's just like 
Thank you all for your time. This is your most valuable resource. We appreciate you spending it with us. We have a really fun kind of night planned here for you, but I do want to just ask if you are joining us to put yourself on mute. Um, that will just help in general, just so then, um, unless you want to speak, and if you do, um, pipe up in the chat and say, I'd love to ask a question live and then unmute yourself and you can ask that live. We will give some Q&A at the end, but really Malcolm's going to start us off with just uh, really a, a basic of, of why we're here tonight and how, um, how we hope to enhance your Christmas festive season um, with a little bit of this drunken herbal libations. Uh, yeah, it's so true. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks again for joining and uh, credit goes to Yaro for kind of inspiring this evening, uh, you know, wanting to, to bring us all together. I know we're all in different parts of the world as everybody has shared, mostly in, in Western Canada, but there's um, many, many beyond that. We're all in a little abode. Some of us are experiencing minus 30 outside and, and others, it's, it's a little bit more balmy, but wherever you are, I uh, hope you're enjoying the holiday season. We want to come together and, and just, just share and, and have some fun and share some information and inspiration. And uh, yeah, we're going to kind of go through a little bit of uh, some of the history of uh, maybe these fermented beverages. And most importantly, that connection between herbalism and alcohol. It, it's kind of as, as old as time in that regard. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, some of the benefits. Why add herbs to alcohol, uh, both on the preparation side, but also on, on the consumption side, this delivery system. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how do we get the herbs in there, right? To be your own kind of brewer, alchemist, even mixologist, right? There's so many different ways that you can create these types of libations. And we want to hear from you guys as well, how, how you go about it and things that you like to mm. add in and, and craft up. It um, looks like Watson on the chat is saying he mixes his nettle and mint tea with Grand Marnier. And uh, <laughs> well, that sounds like a very effective vehicle for the delivery of medicine. So that sounds pretty grand. So we'll have a little show and tell, uh, you know, of, of things that uh, we've made. Denis has one incredible mead that he'll be sharing later on. And uh, I, I've got some, some stuff, you know, this one here. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but I'll, I'll share the story and I'll, I'll have a sip. And uh, we'll get Denis <laughs> live on camera as well, because he's going to have some. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of have fun, share things like that. And uh, then... I've got some books and references we can kind of include into this conversation and then we'll open it up for kind of questions, mm -hmm. Q and A, but we plan to go till about, you know, for the next hour and a bit till about eight 30 and uh, yeah, just, just have some fun. So the chat is open, mm -hmm. type in your questions uh, anytime, feel free to have, you know, video on, as Yara mentioned, we'll just kind of keep it on mute uh, for the first little bit and then, then we'll open it up after that. So uh, maybe we can start off with uh, just kind of laying a foundation. So Yaro, how long have you, you know, obviously being a second generation herbalist, you know, born and raised in a family of, uh, you know, where that is just steeped in your every day. When was it for you and how long have you been doing this uh, kind of these botanical libations, you know, these, these blends? I mean, it was your, your 18, of course, right? Right, of course. <laughs> Since I've been... Uh... 14, 18, 20, no, something in there, whatever, whatever the age is, <laughs> many moons, many moons. But when I was a child, my mom used to always make her own wine, you know, and so I'd always watch them get it all together and like, like her and like three other ladies, four other ladies that all come together and they do all this bottling and this whole kerfuffle and make their own wine and just have this grand time um, just in the process of making it. So I always had that like kind of fondness in my heart of watching the crafting process, right? And as a young herbalist, I always felt like medicine should not be in capsules. I just, I just really had this opposition to capsules. I was like, how can I do this in any way other than capsules? And I got this real big download that like, you have to taste it. And when your organoleptic senses connect in with the medicine, that's when the medicine starts to really affect you at a, not just physiological level, but a mental, spiritual, and emotional level. And then the concept of spirits. And um, alcohol obviously is something as a, as a young person, I tried it out, went to the bar, got sick, didn't enjoy it, had a bad hangover, you know, had a whole experience and thought there was something better, always something better. So 
I started to play with mixing and I just loved mixing from hot elixirs, which are kind of tonic drinks that we made with herbal, herbal teas into starting mixing kind of mocktail cocktail culture and playing with all kinds of different things. My dad, as a herbalist, second generation herbalist, had all kinds of weird alchemy in his liquor cabinet. And I remember the first time I, my friend came over and he was a little more seasoned than me. And he's like, we gotta try this and this and this. And we made the worst swamp water ever. <laughs> it was so bad. Um, but we drank it anyway and we played with it. And how did I know I was drinking like ginsengs and <laughs> weird like he she woo beverages from China that he had brought back and like all these just weird things. So I kind of got started with that in mind. Um, and then it wasn't really until I got deeper into my herbal path that I, I recognized that it's actually easy to ferment yourself. So I would say I've been making mead because mead is the easiest one, in my opinion. It doesn't go bad the way beer does. And wine is a lot more finicky. I've been making mead now for, I'd say, about, about 15 years um, off and on. And really, actually, I got inspired by um, Malcolm and Denny, really, because Malcolm was starting this whole mead, um, well, I don't know, about 10 years ago, you're like a little mead club or something, a little alcohol club. And I was like, whoa, that's so cool. I had all this FOMO. I want to come to Calgary and join their mead club. So I just started making it. And probably the biggest way I learned was honestly making jug wines. So I'd take jugs like this, one jug, and just play with it. And I love foraging. I'm an avid, avid forager. So I'd forage you know, a, a good hour and a half huckleberries. And then I'm like, how can I ferment this? And then I'd forage Saskatoon berries. How can I ferment this? I'd forage the Labrador tea. How can I ferment this? And making jug wines about this size with either honey or sugar is the fastest way to make multiple small batches with small harvests. And so to me, the fast track learning that I found was getting good at here, turning my harvest into a ferment. And I couldn't always make medicine. For a long time, I made a lot of medicine and I do still, but I make all these tinctures. And then I'd be like, okay, I can't drink um, two liters of tincture. <laughs> so I'm not gonna really use all of this medicine myself. And I can't give it all away. You know, at, for, at Harmonic Arts, we were able to like craft up really beautiful medicine and share it wide. But for my own personal harvests, I found it far more empowering to turn it into a fermented beverage in a, in a jug. One jug, you know, takes less than a liter of fruit. And, and it's just a really fun way to do that. So that was about 10 years ago, I really started making jug wines. And um, I've since then, you know, like we talked about, you talked about grapes. Well, this year I harvested a lot of grapes. Um, uh, like our neighbor has um, some really nice Cabernet Sauvignon uh, and Cabernet um, Blanc kind of grapes, a couple of different types. And we, um, we made, I, I meant a little bit overboard. And it's scary because when you make five liter carboys and you've harvested all that and you pressed it all, you're like, oh my God, please don't go bad. Please don't go bad. Please taste good. Please taste good. You know, when you try it halfway through and you're like, oh, it tastes bad. You got to wait. You got to like let it simmer. And something I really love about the fermentation is it also teaches you patience. You need to let it sit. And it teaches you cleanliness. You need to keep it clean. <laughs> so there's a bunch of things that I'd say doing fermentation has taught me so valuable life tools in that way. So yeah, I'd say about 15 years I've been making ferments, um, but it wasn't really till like 10 years ago when Malcolm and their little mead club were, were really getting going and really inspired um, that I, I was like, I got to take this to the next level. And just for those of you who maybe haven't done this before, well, one piece of empowerment I will give you is like, if you try, keep making small batches and you're going to make a bunch that taste bad at first, some that might explode, some that might not ferment, but the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it and the more intuitive it becomes and the easier it feels to, to feel safe to make a five liter batch. So I think this is one of the best ways to empower ourselves. Um, I really don't like buying alcohol. I really don't. Um, so I've been trying not that I'm fully successful, but I'm trying to craft up um, my year supply. So it's always apples, pears, cherries. I do big harvest of, and then grapes. And um, I turn all those into ferments pretty much every year. Yeah, we brought up uh, some interesting points, you know, like a, a functional, you know, benefit to these ferments is it's preserving the harvest, right? Whether it's the herbs that you've gathered to be able to infuse into these drinks, but also, you know, these sugar sources, these food sources, be it your honey, be it your cherries, be it your pears, your apples, your grapes, 
Mm -hmm. uh, sure, one can enjoy them fresh and, and one always does, uh, but this is something that allows you to, you know, preserve that harvest and have it, you know, all the year round. And uh, yeah, so a couple, couple of points and questions came up as you're, as you're sharing there. So Jennifer asks, uh, she's only had meat a few times, but always found it too sweet for her taste. Uh, asked, is it possible to make dry meads? And the answer is absolutely yes. This is the idea of crafting your own. You can customize it to however dry or however sweet you want, however boozy or however light and mild you want. Um, yeah. Natural alcohol fermentation, uh, the limit is 18%. And I personally, I've never even hit that. I'm not sure how you would. Um, but, you know, well, with, with a good champagne yeast, you can get pretty high, you know, yeah. maybe like 15%. Totally. That's, that can be dangerous, especially when it's sweet. <laughs> It'd be very dangerous. It's like it's a one like glass. You. And <laughs> yeah. So, you know, these, these things can be diluted, yeah. you know, and, and Denis, you always yes. reference like the ancient Greeks uh, and they would have their. Oh yeah. Uh, apparently it, they would say like, it's ding. A man must have big balls to go to a <laughs> drinking party and drink undiluted wine. They would take their wine and they would mix it with water. There would actually be a moderator, apparently, who would, yeah. you know, for each round would kind of gauge, you know, how dilute uh, they would make that particular round. Uh, and for particular people, this kind of like moderation. So, yes, it's it's really interesting, like how we're going to talk a little bit about this coming up. But you can you can create your home brews to be as little or as much boozy as you want is that a right word of english malcolm yeah you can make your home brews very boozy or you can make them to be you know like three four percent enjoyably boozy. Boozy. yeah like not so hard but speaking to jennifer's question like can you make mead that is not so sweet that it is uh sickly because it's true it's true like when you make these sweet sweet meads like i would call them sickly sweet they they're gross <laughs> you're adding too much honey is really what it comes down to um in that they're case gross. and something i would recommend is you make a log if you make and, and you you take it you catalog when you're making them so so you add your cup and a half of honey to your jug or whatever, you have two cups of honey and you're like, whoa, that's too sweet. Bring it down a notch next time until you find that right balance. Yeah, totally. And, and you spoke to, you know, doing one gallon at a time. Uh, that's a great place to start and experimenting. Uh, you know, those of us have experience. We've all had a batch that did not work well. I've, I've been teaching workshops for, for years on uh, the mead making. And, uh, you know, many of the staff have, have been a part of those. And, and one guy, like years ago, came to the workshop, tasted them all, was super inspired. And he made five gallons of maca mead that he couldn't drink. <laughs> It was, yeah. said it was horrible. Maca, yeah, too. Like, like I'm I sure. <laughs> I can only handle like a quarter teaspoon of maca these days. <laughs> like, all right. But yeah, if uh, Jennifer's question is Jennifer's question is great as far as like, what is why does she drink this mead that's sweet and she doesn't like it? Well, the truth is mead in the olden days was not like wine. Mead in the olden days was beer-like. It was lower in alcohol, like four or 5%. And it was loaded with bitter herbs, like yeah. super bitter herbs, just like beer. So mead as a sweet wine-like drink is a new phenomenon. I don't know why we it was started precious, doing... right? The honey was precious. You wouldn't, you couldn't even afford to add that much, right? And you want to make it extend out as far as possible. And like Malcolm had mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is was a way of actually cleaning the water, literally. So you're just adding enough of those sweet ingredients to ferment to clean the water enough. And if you're using wild yeasts, right, you're not getting more than a five, six percent maximum. Yeah. So for all of us that are kind of enjoying this, uh, 
you know, renaissance that, you know, if, if you do happen to go to the uh, to liquor store, you can, you know, find all these herbal ales and, you know, gins, or if you go to the bar and it's like all these incredible cocktails of, you know, different botanicals, you think, wow, this is, this is great. This is such a new trend. Uh, absolutely not. It's just, you know, what was always done of, of ancient times. And I would say for beer anyways, probably this man in this book, uh, is Even what better. kind of spearheaded that you know renaissance of bringing beers back to the original sacred herbal and healing so this book uses that that term beer more generically uh of course today there's a very strict definition of, of what is a beer and what is an ale and what is a lager and all these things but uh that book is very kind of broad so using any sugar source whether it's like manioc or corn or tapioca or uh, potatoes. potatoes like you name it every yeah. single culture around the world uh fermented well maybe not every single culture I don't, yeah. I don't, i'm not sure if the inuit did did they well I mean, the, the corn apparently corn alcohol made it as far up as like the iroquois in toronto and stuff up there like corn alcohol made it pretty far up yeah, but, but any access to any kind of fruit, uh, honey, you know, maple, uh, any grain with any kind of starches, humans figured out how to transform that and then turn it into alcohol. And almost, you know, without question, uh, herbs were added to that. And so this book is kind of like, you know, a, a history lesson in that and, and a look into these olden times. And that term, you know, of, of a wife, a midwife, denoted an occupation and, it, and it's still one of the words that we have that uses that but there was not just midwives just like you know husbandry there was you know the ill wives and these were the women that brewed the beers and each town each village each area each you know home within that had its own specialty and they used the herbs that were around them they, they were the herbalists right the herbalist has always been the folk medicine, the people's medicine. And you went to the ale house for what ails you, right? And because it was this delivery system, right. it was an extraction method, number one, right? And a preservation, like we talked about, right? If you're harvesting the sweet ale, if you're picking the Labrador, if you're mm, picking- Sweet ale is so beautiful in a, in a yeah. beverage. Like whatever it is, right? And in, in just the peak of its moment, and then you know to infuse it in into uh, a beer or an ale and use that as as the preservation and the delivery system was what this was all about and uh it was what 15 16 or i, I never i never remember the date uh the beer purity act uh right. which when then, the roman catholic church came in and standardized hops you mean that's right yeah so this is kind of one of the first you know mandates you know no, no, we're all tired of mandates these days but i mean how long has this been going on for uh this is one of the first original like double speaks of this kind of bureaucracy first standardized herbal um extract was hops in beer that was it right. yeah and that was used as a as a way to kind of you know con control uh shall we say like you know hops are uh sedative they're very calming they're very relaxing uh you know, and that's that's great for the the monks, as a as a very kind of calming, you know, conducive to their lifestyle. They are an an aphrodisiac. Mm -hmm. I know beer is kind of sold as this, you know, aphrodisiac beverage, and you know the, the dudes in the ads with all the women. But you know, there was a phenomenon amongst male brewers, particularly the monks, of brewers droop and breasts and bellies. They would get breasts and bellies. And then look at, go to the bar, go to any bar and look at the old men that drink a lot of beer and you'll see breasts, bellies, and they're probably at the bar because they're not getting it on. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, they're probably at the bar. So to like add to that story, there was a problem where like berserker beers with like high testosterone beers and real androgen boosting beers were creating a lot of like enraged people that were actually going and like raping and pillaging the town next to them. So like there was, there was the other side of that too. And I understand like, not to be the devil's advocate here, but like the, the Roman Catholic church was trying to figure out how to control the masses 
And one thing that alcohol did was actually free people from a sense of wanting to be controlled. And so how could they control the alcohol? And that's how, um, that's how that came about was that berserker beers. Um, and we've been making a lot of like pine pollen beer here to be like the opposite of an androgen. Um, every year I make a pine pollen batch and I find it's such a beautiful taste to add in, um, to have that pine pollen androgen beer. And it's more like a, it's an invigorating drink, right? Versus a, a drooping drink. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, so that's, a, that's a, it's very fascinating um, conversation about hops. Um, hops is one of those things that I've avoided for years because I heard about its estrogenic effect. So hops in beer is estrogenic and it's, it's one of the reasons I did start making mead. I was like, I don't want my gonads to, I do, I do not want my gonads to atrophy. Like, I don't want, I don't want to have my gonads like turn to little raisins and I don't want to, you know, I want to keep being able to, I want to keep being able to make love and it's my old age. So, you know, uh, I, I avoided all hop strings for a long time until I started reading about phytoestrogens, like, so hops is an estrogen, it's true. But it apparently, the new research is saying, if you drink enough hops, it can protect you from the bad estrogens. From xenoestrogens. Yeah, there's bad estrogens out there that can really like, those well, are the culprits. Those are things in plastics and a lot of the like water bottles where we have like water, light shining through thin plastic water. Like that's where you leach out the xenoestrogens, plastic shopping bags, all these kind of things. We're riddled with that. In fact, um, like methyl groups, methyl donors are really important in our diet. That includes a lot of those are found in ferments, which break down the nutrition to actually make it more bioavailable and get more methyl groups in there. So methylated vitamins, but also methylated nutrients. And then just to like, as you're saying, the phytoestrogens and the, the high quality estrogens will help protect you. And, and I think men and women both need estrogen just as much as men and women both need testosterone. Ironically, there's more testosterone in a female body than there is estrogen. It's just that estrogen is far more dominant and far more powerful of a chemical um, than testosterone, but that makes lean muscle mass, right? So that's really important too there to have both. So it's not like a, you know, it's not a, a Mars versus Venus kind of equation where we're all, we all need both. Yeah. Anyway, so, so then it becomes about, you know, when you are choosing a, you know, a beverage or you're crafting a beverage, it really comes about, you know, like, the three keys I think about you know, when I think about alchemy and, and crafting and be that a ferment or anything is this idea of flavor, function, and feeling. So, you know, why, why is hops in, in the beer to begin with? Well, we talked a little bit about this kind of function oh, yeah. of, you know, the anti-berserker, you know, the, the calming, you know, sedative type vibe that it has. Like that's one of the functions of hops as well as, as Denise yeah. was mentioning, the kind of uh, estrogen balance especially in the modern day with uh xenoestrogen so there could be some protection there i've heard like i've heard that hops was in beer was a very favorite farmer's drink and it was especially because well you know that hops is related to marijuana right everyone hops Closest is related. related to marijuana and they would get home after their long day of work they would have a beer first. They would drink their beer, they would relax. And then they could have dinner. So beer was like a dinner. They would have beer like after their long days work, relax, muscle relaxant. Well, I, I would say a lot of people still use a beer in that way, right? It's like, uh, <laughs> it's like instant relaxation. like. I haven't even had a sip yet, but there's that associated like, ah, okay, here, here, yeah. here comes the beer, here comes the hops. So, um, so hops is related to marijuana and it 
it does provide a muscle relaxants, like pain relieving effect and it makes you relaxed to have your dinner. That was the, that was the or apparently the origins of it. They would have it as a farmer's drink. Right. And then, so this idea, so that, that's a lot about function and we'll, we'll keep coming back to that uh, and even connect to that feeling of relaxedness. Uh, but the flavor, you know, of hops is, is primarily bitter. And uh, so that, as you said, you know, like a lot of these ancient uh, herbal brews, uh, the Gruet Ale sings like yarrow. Oh, of, of, of right. our namesake here. You know, very bitter. bitter herb, you know, digestive herb. <laughs> uh, but also it, it acted as a preservative. So this is why we have things like, you know, the IPAs, the India pale ales, which are super hopped up, like lots of extra hops because they had a much uh, stronger preservative effect to allow that beer to travel, you know, on the oceans, you know, in the hot climates of, of India, the hops played, had, a, had, a, had a function there in its flavor. Yeah, I feel like the bitter note is something that is lost in the modern world. And actually, one thing that these type of beverages can bring back is more of that bitter. And bitter squeezes the liver like a sponge. It just moves. So, so when people say, you know, like, for example, alcohol can be hard on the liver, right? Like this is one of the downsides of too much alcohol. Well, good bitters alongside it is, is basically a bit of an antidote to help squeeze the liver, to help digest and break down cholesterol better and to move out toxins. So in a way it can be utilized as a flushing of the system if it's got enough bitters in it. And if, if you're finding like the sweets, I mean, obviously we need all five flavors. And one thing that, that hops does have to it is more complex flavor, similar to how chocolate and coffee and green tea, they all have a complex flavor where you can pick out some sweet notes in that hops. You can pick out some, some sour notes in that hops. So these complex flavors in these herbs, they actually spark our, our mind and our intelligence at a bigger level too. Uh, now, beer can definitely dumb you down. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that I've seen a lot of dudes. I mean, I make the joke, oh, <laughs> you know, like, because it's just, it is a bit of a like numbing effect sometimes when, when there's too much of that, so, right? Anything so let me ask you this question, Hero. <laughs> but yeah, let me ask you this question. Um, as far as modern beers go, how much of the bad effects are coming from monoculture agriculture? So I know that I know that glyphosate, for example, or GMO grains and no pesticides nope. they they actually kill the they they're still present in the grains when they make a beer like the gmo pesticides are still in the grains and when you drink that it's been proven that when you eat gmo bread or you eat gmo wheat you consume gmo bread uh beer it's it it kills your gut bacteria and then that's the big difference between what we are promoting tonight and what is available to the masses we we're promoting living culture kind of stuff and that's what i understand well, that beer available today is full of glyphosate and it actually kills your gut bacteria. Yeah, that's a big part of it for sure. I mean, obviously it's not just beer. It's, it's everywhere in our society. Um, a lot of the like gluten intolerance worlds, um, we become, I call it glutarded. <laughs> we, our guts <laughs> are completely um, like unable to handle so much of this because they're already inflamed from the the glyphosate from all of the, the roundup ready wheat from all of the gmo um crops so we know that's bad and the problem for most people is that they don't have the skills to um to craft their own or the time right so my my suggestion is that it's not just that also a lot of the like over pasteurized things are are basically killing anything that was living we are an ecosystem. Our body is an ecosystem. In order to thrive, 
we need to feed the ecosystem and we need to feed it with living cells that can can recolonize a lot of prebiotics and probiotics um you know a lot of people are getting into that the problem with most probiotics is that they don't actually recolonize the gut what actually recolonizes the gut is living tissues not these these little gel caps filled with with dead um grown in a lab um probiotics you need living unpasteurized um like like prebiotics basically and and then fermented so one of the beauties of creating good fermented beverages is that you are packing in almost like instead of sending yuppies into a gang-filled neighborhood in your gut with a whole lot of cash to get mugged and robbed by the gangsters um, because they're, they just have no immune system, you're sending in these like troopers with a backpack full of prebiotics that are ready to bushwhack through the hardest terrain. And because most of us have this inflamed gut, it, it is it just worsens and worsens the situation. And what ends up happening is our whole immune system over fires. And a lot of people end up with autoimmune stuff coming on because they get this inflamed gut. They then get leaky gut. They then get um, pathogens coming in through food stuff that should be kept in the gut, gets into the bloodstream. Our body then creates antibodies to it. And this whole cascade happens. And you end up, so much of our world is based um, on dealing with chronic disease. And it all stems from our gut health and from not fueling our microbiome. So when it comes to fermenting your own beverages, that's another huge part that's so like overlooked and underestimated is that you're actually creating a prebiotic and a probiotic all in one that is aligned with the way that the, the, the nature works. I, I, I'll tell you a story that is the, the funniest thing I ever did see was a bear in my yard getting drunk, <laughs> literally eating the apples under my tree, just like, oh, full of prebiotics, all this nice apple pectin. And they were all fermented and rotten and the bear's just in there. And he's like, kind of, ooh, and he's starting to like kind of lean against the tree and then eat some more fruit. And like, this is a natural thing. Like, like this is a fun festive fall bear habit. They go in and they don't even want the apples on the tree. They want the apples that are going to make them drunk, literally. <laughs> so, so fermented frozen fruit too, like berry bushes. Trust me, the animals go out and pick the frozen berries that have thawed a little bit and then refroze and then thawed a little bit. And those, the sugars have ripened, they've teased out the alcohols and they get a little bit drunk. But you know what that does? It enhances their winter immunity. It puts on the proverbial beer skin. <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's not, not just bears. Uh, you know, in the springtime, you talk about those winter berries, right? The migration. Well, the squirrels and bear birds. <laughs> yeah, and the birds. I've, I've seen, you know, deers, the deers coming in, like their, their flying patterns get, you know, more and more erratic as they go from bush to bush to bush. Porcupines get drunk. Yeah, they... They got drunk too. Yeah. So anything else we want to talk about? So kind we're of talking just, about something that's pretty natural. Yeah, no, totally. Right. And, and obviously something as well that, you know, in our kind of modern society or in, I mean, even in, in ancient civilizations too, there's, there's always that fine line too, in, in terms of, uh, you know, what, what is that right amount uh, for you? Context is also huge. So just finding that right relationship with alcohol. I, I'm sure we all know somebody in our life that kind of can and does or has taken it too far. Um, so, you know, it, it's an individual journey. It's something to be respected, uh, but it's also something not to kind of be ashamed of. If, if you have that right relationship, if you have fun with this medium, uh, it, it's a great thing and it's very natural and it's very human and it's very a part of, of life. But the, the challenge that Denny's kind of trying to allude to and speak to is the opportunity to actually connect in with this to create a right relationship is sometimes not easy because the what's being made available to us is often these GMO pasteurized products made in large facilities that are, are very standardized and not actually feeding um, the soul in that sense, you know, and they're not, they don't contain that fifth element. This is something I really wanted to just make sure that got captured and distilled a little tonight is that there is this like spirits, you know, spirit, spirit, this fifth element of the alchemy of uh, the transmutation of these foods and of these herbs that comes through 
in creating fermented beverages. And there's like an inspirited quality that can actually raise our spirits at a, at a, at a deep level, especially when you go through winter depression, you know, or when you go through like just dark days, um, this can be really a healthy relationship is easily turned unhealthy, not just from the quality of what's available. Oh, I think I froze. Yeah, no, you're, you're all back. You did, you did freeze for a second, but I, you know, I want to just emphasize that point that you made that, you know, you know, people going to the liquor store, though the quality is definitely improving, you know, like it's, it's the equivalent of going to the convenience store and, and going grocery shopping, right? It's like the level of consciousness, the level of quality of ingredients, you know, like it's lacking that, that essence, that spirit. And hence we yeah. come back to this idea of, of craft and what we we're talking about before of like, you know, we, we can be drawn to certain brands, we can be drawn yeah. to certain beverages because it does have that spirit imbued in it, where there's, there's a craftsman, there's a vision, there's a spirit. And uh, we have 10,000 years or more of craving that. And it's like part of our evolution. It goes way back to before humans were humans when we were still animals. That's what the Vikings say. Hey? If, if you ask the Viking, well, if you look back at the, the Vikings say, we were but animals before we tasted the mead, the honey wine of the heavens. And then that's what made us poets. That's what made us different from animals. So there's something, uh, part of our evolution, part of our biology, we crave it. And there's this term I've heard called, Malcolm, you might know about it, toxic mimics. Like it might look the same, it might taste the same, but it's not the same thing that our ancestors drank. Right. Our ancestors did not drink the same beer that we're drinking right now and it's only like 50 years ago i don't know how it's not that long ago we stopped we we stopped making living probiotic alcohol that's a there's there's a resurgence it's it's coming back it's, you know, it's pretty impressive actually i every every year um when i go to the higher end places i'm like wow like i i know in calgary for example you have a couple of meteries there and um, I do see these like Heather beers and I do see these unpasteurized, unfiltered, um, unique beverages that people are, are starting to bring to a larger platform. The challenge does come around um, scaling that stuff, right? And it's the whole thing that I'm like all about the backyard herbalist. It's the backyard brewer too. It's such a, a empowering thing. Uh, and I, I just, I can't say enough about how empowering it is to know how to craft your own beverages in this way. Um, and you don't have to do it all the time, but when you do and you taste it, it's like, wow, you know, what a, what a difference that is, you know, if it's good. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah. yeah. Cool. So anything else you want to add to, uh, you know, the benefits, the synergy of kind of, you know, alcohol and, and herbs, we're kind of blurring the lines here. We're talking a lot about, you know, alcohol and it's kind of essence of what it is, but we're really like trying to bring this merger of, of how herbs have been intertwined. So we talked about it being a way to preserve the harvest. We talked about it being a delivery system, uh, kind of a, an enhancement, you know, for flavor, mm -hmm. for function, for feeling. Uh, what, are the, what other benefits do you see as this yeah, we, synergy? Yeah, we haven't asked Yarrow that question yet. Like, so that was my first question for Yarrow was like, alcohol itself has therapeutic benefits right you know like doesn't matter what it, what it, it is doesn't, but, it doesn't like it's drying in nature it is it is a bit drying right so you do need to make sure you're moistening the tissues um sometimes adding demulcents adding digestives can be good but the main benefit i think of alcohol is that it it, it drives things deeper into the body so it's a carrier and i call this it's part of what I call taxi cab medicine, which means it's the driver that brings in the other herbs. It's one of the reasons I love tinctures because they bypass digestion. They go right into the bloodstream very quickly. They're through the mouth. They absorb through the, the salivatory the saliva. They absorb through the esophagus. Into, in, before they even hit the digestive system, they're absorbing. So there is, there is something that I would think of the main quality that alcohol brings is as a delivery system, right? So 
So yeah, I, I would use it as a tool for delivering medicine more so than the, the destination, right? This is the problem with our society is we end up, the destination is after six tequilas, I'm fine. <laughs> like, like, like no, uh, think of it as um, a delivery system. It is a way of, of, of uh, transcribing. It is also another way of, of like on a, on a more esoteric psycho-spiritual level of allowing the muse to penetrate through your hard shell. A lot of us have thickened our way of being and we've constricted our, our flexibility to a certain uh, mean uh, demeanor in order to fit into our sociological conditioning. A little bit of lubrication and the muse starts to play, <laughs> you know? So, so there's another therapy there that is a delivery system for you to the higher realms as well. Uh, so, you know, so inspiriting, you know, em embodying that spirit um, is a quality. And, and we see this if for good or for bad. I mean, many of our most uh, amazing artists, I'll, I'll use like Sal Salvador Dali as an example who, you know, inspirited, but just too far, but what beautiful art he was able to create from that. Or many, many of the like, you know, a lot, there's, there's just so many artists that have gone a little too far, but what we can take from that is that um, we can see that quality um, when kept in, I'll say a little bit more of the Zen Buddhist philosophy of, of um, you know, just a little bit, not too, too much, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the middle path, right? The moderation. And uh, okay, so Lasheka, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, has asked a great question, which kind of brings up another you know, point of, of, of benefits. So I would say that alcohol does in and of itself has its own benefits uh, separate from herbs. Uh, we talked about preservation, we talked about delivery, that kind of thing. It makes you sing, it makes you dance, it makes you... <laughs> paint perhaps in part put on your yeah. prancer sizer pants <laughs> <laughs> uh but there's also in in what you mentioned these kind of naturally fermented beers which you know like this book talks about from any type of sugar source uh you know the yeast itself uh becomes a, a nutrient right in, in any kind of vegetarian vegan health foodie will will know and maybe he's had a kick of like this you know nutritional yeast or brewer's yeast or intravita yeast yeah. right you know the b vitamins the protein so the question was you know and, and yara hold up that jug that question. uh that one gallon you know look, look at the bottom of it check out the bottom so that is what's called the plonk so it's that kind of brown cloudiness at the bottom now yeah. did he bring over your bottle here yeah. Yeah. yeah this has been aged for a long uh, so this this, this is a matter of like choice and style so yarrow's got something really kind of raw crude it's like full of that sentiment denis has hyper clarified it yeah you should be able to uh i want to make sure you guys can see what denis holding up um so super clarified and, well yeah and that's and, just aging it well it's, well it's, it's also it's, racking it right racking it. yeah so racking it off the yeast um, this becomes a personal choice in, in the process. And sometimes, you know, the flavor can change if, if you let it sit on the yeast too long. Um, but there are also benefits like brewer's yeast is literally just that, that plonk, that sediment uh, left over at, at the bottom of, of your brews, yeah. which is, it's thick. It's full of B vitamins and it's full of protein. Uh, it's actually a good nutrient source. So, you know, maybe the best of both worlds is might, you might rack it off, which is basically you take a, a siphon and just kind of siphon it into another bottle and you leave all that sediment. You can drink that. Uh, you can cook with it, all types of things. You're going to get a ton of nutrition from that. Uh, or you can kind of mix it up like this one here. Yeah is actually, you know, it's been bottled. Look but how cloudy it is comparatively. Like, quite cloudy. you can see everything through my guitar here. But this is aged like... Uh, and then you can get ones like, I can't even see through this one. It's so dark. <laughs> it's just like, so dark. Yeah. So yeah, these, these are all kind of stylistic preferences um, as, as you get into the art and into the craft. So it, it sounds like our ancient forefathers drank the cloudy stuff they didn't they didn't care they wanted that they drank up the cloudy stuff i, I will say <laughs> though like personal preference is to definitely rack my mead two times um i i prefer to like once it's really done its 
primary fermentation to rack it once and then let it sit one more time before I bottle it. Um, that's that's my personal preference. So I, wa I, I wanted to ask you a question, Yero. I wanted to ask you a question about when you take herbs, right? You kind of want to guarantee that people are taking their herbs. So I've noticed personally that when I when I look at my herb cabinet, sometimes I just say, dang, I should just make mead with all these herbs and it's gonna guarantee that I it's gonna guarantee you take it. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna guarantee compliance. So is that is that one of the benef benefits of making these preparations? It depends on the person. I mean, like some people are just love drinking tea, you know, like um, I, I get into this tea habit every so like in the winter months and I just love drinking tea. I'll drink my mead too, um, but it just depends on the person. Like, whereas my mom, she'll, she'll never drink tea. She's like, oh, tea, so boring. Like, oh, I gotta drink tea again. <laughs> it's like, so yeah, for sure. For some people, 100% making it into a mead is the best way to guarantee it's going to go down. And this really stems to the whole concept of like compliance is king, right? Like will, like the only way the medicine works is if you take it. And Mary Poppins, you know, famously said a teaspoon of sugar or in our case, honey helps the medicine go down, right? It's the same thing, but now you fermented the honey to make it help, help it go down. So yeah, I, I, I believe that too. Um, I think, one thing I like to do though, is I like to intentionally set that tone when I'm harvesting. So I make like, like I've, I've got this one called mountain man tea and I turn mountain man tea into a mead most years. And it's my Labrador tea. It's a little bit of that sweet gale. It's the licorice fern and it's the wild ginger. And this all together makes this most beautiful flavor. This licorice fern has a little bit of that like sweet harmonizing note. The ginger gives a bit of spice. The tannins from the Labrador tea just really pull it together. And the sweet gale has that aroma that is just so intoxicating. And so tea, I like it. But then what I do usually is I brew up this super dark, dank, strong tea. And the first batch goes right into the carboy with some yeast and honey. And the second batch I'll then sip on while I watch my, my <laughs> watch it bubble. So, so there's, you know, it, it can be a bit of both in some ways, I think. But yeah, I, I would say that I definitely prefer to harvest herbs knowing that I'm going to take them because I've already got a pre-planned mead planned out myself. You know, another one would be like this one actually that I have here. I made this, Denny, during your um, mead class at the Canadian Herb Conference. I got inspired. I was watching you making, talking about it. I'm like, I'm going to make a mead right while I watch this class. And so this is an adaptogen, um, reishi, ashwagandha, holy basil, super tonic, um, basically our adapting gems um, mead with a little bit of extra hishu woo in it. Um, nice. Uh, this strong you, uh... medicine that I know will serve me in the winter months when I need those adaptogens, right? So November, early November, perfect time. This is ready for me to drink in February kind of thing. Are you aiming for baby number four? There you are, are you? No, I have four four babies already. <laughs> baby five. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that's what this stuff does to you. It makes you kind of, it makes you kind of want to make love, it's true. That's a, that's that when you just any. <laughs> All right, that, that's but, part of that more of that function feeling uh, going on there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we we got to let, let's cover off some questions. We have some good questions that have come in here. So, uh, what kind of yeast are you using with this? And I'll just say, you know, Denis for the Calgary Fermentation Fest, he taught a whole hour long session yeah. on, you know, yeast literally and different types of yeast that you can use. So maybe probably the best first, the easiest is literally you're at the beer making, uh, wine making supply store, you can get yeast and there are catalogs of different yeah. types of yeast where most of us have started off is just the champagne yeast. It's the type of yeast that seems most well adapted to, you know, the, the sweetness and level of honey. And uh, we will send you some recipes of mead making and not only that, but the different herbs that 
you can add to to glorify the experience and I don't know I don't know we started talking about aphrodisiacs here Malcolm and yeah. mead and we we should talk about that like the honeymoon right and yeah that whole I, idea I don't want to miss this topic of conversation but yeah, it is a there are, specialty of focus of yours. So before that hops was added to beer, as we were talking earlier, a lot of the herbs that were added were extremely aphrodisiac, like extremely boner inducing. Like we're talking erections of quality. We're talking like herbs that The ones that we have in our formula, we call my Dixadryl. <laughs> Is that the, the one you're making? The pharmaceutical grade libido enhancer? Yeah, and like the question is, did that, um, is that, yeah, that's that's what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, well, mead I, was used that way. I prescribe to more like the antidepressing qualities um, and I prescribe more to like, nerve vine enhancing adaptogen uh, fortifying qualities i i think that those are are there as well um but you know also mineralizing like somebody's mentioned what about nettles i mean nettles yeah i mean it's strong flavored it's very mineral rich nettles is better in a beer in my mind than a mead but it can totally be a good one there you know um i like things like lucid dreaming type herbs like mugwort and the labrador tea and the sweet gale those are all great lucidity herbs. Um, I like adding like mallow flowers that are gentle. Um, uh, I like the shizandra berries that are toning, you know, those are, there's some neat flavors you can get. Mm. I think it's really important when you're formulating for one of these that you consider adding something of a sour tart berry flavor along with your bitters and along with your mineral rich herbs. Uh, that, at least in my mind, um, you know, enhancing the flavor, bitter is offset by both spicy and sour, right? So if it's too bitter, it's not as easy to drink. But if you add a little bit of sour and spicy to that, it can it can overthrow the bitter a little bit. So, so you can actually get more bitters in that way. Um, the other thing is add a little sweet. So like fennel um, or licorice, like the licorice fern I add in. Um, now that can be too too much as well. Yeah, um, like you know, after like yeah, after dinner. Um, I remember yarrow anise, I, uh, liqueurs. I used, I used my meat as first aid on you do you remember the time you went to the seaweed or seafood conference right you came home with like a, oh you were like oh my stomach is so upset so much weird seafood um, yarrow was in tremendous pain i was like dude you just gotta drink this mead glug 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 but um 20 minutes later no complaining coming from yarrow shoes <laughs> yeah there's so the digestive quality and i think we've been talking about ferments a lot something i wanted to kind of maybe segue into is like what are some of the other ways we can add herbs and add these ingredients to alcohols right like what are like it doesn't just have to be fermentation like for example um we had a staff party um and we made what we call gin gin pears and we took gin a nice botanically infused gin and we just infused extra ginger in it so we made this ginger tincture out of the gin, right? And then we fermented some pear juice to make a fermented pear cider, added it to it and added bubbly water. So we had pear cider, um, juniper, like juniper infused gin with, with ginger and a little bit of bubbly water. And man, what a great little cocktail that was, you know? So what are some of the other ways that you guys like to add herbs beyond just like the fermentation process. So that's like, we know that you can make your base, right? You can obviously brew up your herbal tea. You can crush down your berries. You can um, extract it in that process. But what are some of the other ways you guys like to work with herbs and, and yeah, berries totally. and foods? I kind of broke down a list of all, all the different ways we can get herbs into these beverages. So you mentioned, you know, the kind of the first, the most obvious is, is you make a tea, you know, whether that's fruits, whether that's leaves, barks, so on and so forth, you make a tea and, and the basic recipe for making a mead or, you know, what you, you know, your one gallon kind of jug is you then add a, a sugar source. We like honey. Uh, it's a very kind of local, you know, appropriate uh, superfood. 
as that sugar source, you add in yeast. And then this will just kind of finish off that question is you can buy store-bought yeast or you can use wild yeast. You know, wild yeast are they're everywhere. They're opportunistic. Mm. Um, you actually don't even need to go seek them out. You can literally just, you know, honey, a yeah. food that perfectly preserves itself forever you know, until so you, you create an imbalance in the moisture content. So when bees go out and they gather nectar from flowers, they bring it back to the hive, they fan it, basically to, to dehydrate it and they bring it right to that exact moisture content that will perfectly preserve it forever so as soon as you upset that perfect balance it is susceptible for fermentation meaning bacteria yeast will come in they love that sugar they're going to digest it and then product of fermentation so you know it's it's argued that you know meat is the most original oldest fermentation because honey is the most original oldest pure form of sugar sweetener that we have and that in order for it to ferment all we need to do is you know maybe it's it's water uh, or rather honey dripping into a uh, puddle or it is a vessel of honey that gets water added to it right and those opportunistic yeast come they digest it fermentation happens as a result so by creating a tea adding some sort of form of sugar yeast come in naturally spontaneous begins to ferment it you know any type of tea can be used uh in beer brewing a lot of the times it's in that mash process so Denny mentioned that beer is made from sprouted grains barley in particular and heating it up activates the enzymes and oftentimes in that mash you can yeah, throw makes the starches available yeah it makes the starches available you throw your herbs in right so that the hops go in that hop mash Essentially, it's, it's a decoction of sorts, and then the fermentation process begins. You can also have water, sugar source, and then add herbs, and then it brews during fermentation, right? So there's so many different layers. You can also do what's called the secondary ferment. Someone asked me the question about uh, kombucha, so would be very familiar with the, the secondary ferment, where whatever it is that you fermented uh, has gone through its fermentation period, and then, so there's a certain level of alcohol, then you add the herbs to that as it sits. You could rack it off the yeast, sit it in another carboy, add any kind of herb, and then it's almost a very kind of mild, you know, tincturing process. It's for flavoring, the yeah. Yeah, it's a flavoring, right? And the that's actually thing. useful because the first fermentation is easy when it's clean. Sometimes your tea can have too much weird, funky stuff in it and not enough tannins, not the right compounds and, and the, the, the brew doesn't work very well. You know, so yeah, so the second fermentation is a, is a key way to add different flavors that can really enhance that both in kombucha and in, in meat making, you know, in that sense. Yeah, so this is the art, this is the craft, right? Of all these different kind of entry points, if you're crafting your own. There's one more I wanted to say about your primary fermentation and about like beer brewing that actually brings this to the note is that typically with hops, you add hops in at multiple different times in the, in the cook. So you don't just, and this is really important about herbs, some herbs like roots and stuff you add in first, and then you add in your lighter herbs that don't take as much that are going to break down um, with the gentle herbs, the flowers. So I would tend to make your mash or your brew in this like staged, what we call an evolutionary tea, where you start with your thick stuff and then your light gentle notes come in later on and you might only brew them for like five minutes. You might just throw that last dash of, of a fragrant flower in or a peppermint in at the end if you wanted that. Anyway. Totally. And, and actually one thing I learned about uh, using heather in brewing is that that's one of the classic, you know, Scottish brewing herbs is, uh, they would do exactly that. They would actually add the heather in for that kind of brew into the mash. And that would pull out more of those kind of like, you know, strong, deep, bittering notes. And mm. then once that was finished, they would pass it through, you know, new, fresh heather flowers. And just that simple kind of like passing Filter through would capture more of those light floral notes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there's there's a lot of um, I'll say double double boil and trouble can can really be much more intricate in the way in which we curate the flavors and the chemistry that comes out. And this is where like a little bit of organic chemistry is really useful. 
you know, like, like stuff like your polysaccharides, they take a long time to break down, but your essential oils and, and some of these lighter compounds, they just need to run through the hot water very lightly, very quickly, right? No more than two minutes to really pull out those. Otherwise they denature. Yeah. Okay. So other ways, so that's basically, you know, those are all the different ways you know, kind of get to extract, include the herbs in the fermentation. Uh, Post-fermentation, whether it is, you know, like a, a natural uh, level of alcohol, and by that, I mean anything under 18%, and that all depends on the, the yeast source as well as the sugar source, will give you that whole range. So someone mentioned kombucha earlier, you know, kombucha even itself contains, you know, quarter percent, half a percent, uh, of alcohol. And you can increase that. Alcohol uh, is created in anaerobic condition. So if you have a kombucha and you want to increase the alcohol, and if you go to the States, you can actually buy, you know, alcoholic kombucha. And what they do is that gets increased in the anaerobic phase of the fermentation. Yeah. And in Eau Claire Mall in Calgary, you can get, there's an alcoholic kombucha brewery. Oh, okay. Eau Claire. I don't know their name, but they they capitalized on that idea that you can make alcohol with any form of sugar. Yeah, any any form of sugar. Yeah, you can get it going on. So post fermentation, you know, either that kind of low percentage, or if it's distilled, and then the distillation process. And you mentioned gin, and many people are enjoying that type of a beverage where. Uh, taking a natural ferment and concentrating the alcohol, you can either literally throw the herbs in with, you know, the alcohol and then steam distill it out, or you have the alcohol in the base. And then as the vapor rises as a steam, you can actually have this kind of chamber of herbs and the alcohol passes through that. And that's typically how gin is made. So as it's kind of brewing and it's steaming, that steam passes through things like juniper and orange peel and angelica, and it picks up all those compounds, aromatic compounds, <laughs> and then it's kind of uh, recondensed back down uh, into a gin. So I remember that time we went to the gin festival, Malcolm. And, oh my gosh. Uh, we ended up, I ended up naked in the river. I don't know if you did. Well, I, was, I was naked in the river too. I yeah. don't know if you ended up naked. I Make mean, imagine like that, this, but... <laughs> I mean, you know, being herbalist, I mean, this is why I'm a bit of a sucker for gin, like, because it, it's such an incredible botanical beverage. Yeah. We went to this gin festival where literally entrance got you access to probably about 50 different gins and you, you want to taste them all. Right. And, you know, you, you try and pace yourself. It's like, okay, I have a little taste of this. And, and they're all so unique. They're also fascinating. Uh, all these different makers and distillers. Yeah. So, so this was one of my questions for Yarrow. So, okay, if we're talking about gin, we're talking about a herbal beverage, but why is it clear? Why is gin clear when herbal tinctures are dark? Well, I, I can answer that. Still, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. No, like, go ahead, Malcolm. I'm sure. You, yeah, like, <laughs> but it's just it's because it's distilled, you know, really, it's it's the that process of coming through and dripping down in the, the distilling process, right? It's not. Yeah. But why wouldn't you want the the colors of the why would you want it to be clear versus I suppose the question is the difference between, you know, distillation and, and like a tincture extraction. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, you're going to get different notes. Like, like the 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 distillation is pulling out the essential oils, really only exclusively the aromatic compounds, the fragrance, the volatile oils, the smell. Right, gin has a smell to it as you drink it. You're getting out. You're not getting the body of the herb, right? The thing about a tincture is you are pulling out more of the body. You're getting more of those other compounds, right? That are, and and some of that is just straight up chlorophyll. You know, so like in a sense, it is a little more um, intelligent way of um, pulling out the spirits is through a distillation process. And if you look at like spigerics and you look at the whole spigeric tincturing, you're doing that as well. So you're adding the almost the gin 
to the juniper, let's just say juniper, you'd add the distillation of the juniper plus the juniper tincture, plus then you'd burn down the mark into an ash, filter it through water, evaporate that off, add the crystals back in, and then you're adding in the body of it, right? So so there's, there's many ways, like a, a spigeric tincture is adding all those layers. Um, and that gets into your more alchemy of trying to add in all the layers. But I, I, I would say that um, in general, like when, like we supply a couple, of, we've supplied a few um, generators. There's one out here, Wayward Distillery. Um, and these guys go through like 50 pounds of juniper berry, like it's nothing. <laughs> like it's just, it's, it's huge amounts. They use a lot more than you would even in a tincture method in that sense, um, because they're just pulling out that essence. Yeah, no, it's true. It's it's more that kind of etheric quality. Um, yeah, Wayward's great. Anyway, yeah. and there's some neat places like that. They make a honey alcohol. Um, I think this is really a new thing too that's coming up that we're seeing is these um, micro distilleries. Um, and they're like, like for example, that um, what's that Devil's Club one out of Pemberton? I think that's yeah, that's cool. yeah totally. Yeah, like a cool. It's like a Devil's Club tequila or something. It's like really well, neat. It's using a, it's a Devil's Club absinthe. So they absinthe, use right. uh, potatoes grown in the Pemberton Valley. They create vodka from that, and then they infuse it with uh, Devil's Club wormwood and all these other herbs. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's some really neat stuff coming out. Like like just some innovators that are creating and beautiful because. Devil's Club, here's a herb that has blood sugar regulating qualities. It's also spiritually protective, like these little spikes on it. It's in the ginseng aurelia family. So it's an adaptogen in that same form. Like what a beautiful herb to infuse into the spirits, you know? Like, like so there is some neat stuff that you can do that way. And that's just another way that distilling is another way to add these herbs in um, and get big volumes of these herbs. I would say, even when you do, after you take a distilled liquid, then you can make a tincture. That's another great way. Like I did the gin gin pear and I mentioned making a gin with uh, ginger, just adding infused ginger in or mulled wine. You've all made mulled wine maybe. Um, and I'm curious about your, your uh, milky drink. Like, what is that? <laughs> is that another way we can make? All right. Well, before we get to the milky drink, yeah. uh, Denis wants to uh, share a little bit about his next well, beverage. So, yeah, and I have a question for you, Yero, about. Okay, so let me. <laughs> Maybe not. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, my question for you has to do with targeting specific organs with tinctures like is it true that when you take herbs that are good for your liver in alcohol it you're hitting your liver like with those herbs so you you're like targeting your liver with with tinctures well <clears throat> So, so one of the, the problems, and I'm just going to backtrack this for a second, is the whole magic bullet phenomenon of good for this. Like it, it's a function of the liver. So, for example, milk thistle is rebuilding for the liver, whereas dandelion is cleansing for the liver, right? So, good for the liver could be taken in very, just very different ways. Um, are we rebuilding the liver or are we cleansing the liver? Are you know, so the build and cleanse, the wax and wane, what are you trying to do there? I think if you're trying to cleanse the liver, um, then directly hitting it that way, yeah, that's a good thing. But if you're building the liver, I'm not sure that alcohol is the best way to, um, to, to prescribe milk thistle. For example, like I would rather take milk thistle as an oatmeal. I would rather grind it up in my, my herb grinder, add hot water and make porridge and eat it like that. Like that would be a way better way to restore and rebuild. But if I'm trying to cleanse the liver, adding bitter herbs and into an alcohol format is going to penetrate deep and help squeeze that liver, right? So my artichoke, my dandelion, my, um, my, my burdock, you know, my black radish, all of those would be great in a alcohol format to drive right into the liver. And if you're looking at different other organ systems, think about it. I like to think about it in the Chinese medicine method. Um, which is very simplistic and it's more like the hologram of the organ, not the actual organ itself. 
but each organ system or major organ system has a different flavor. So if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to hit the pancreas and the stomach, I'm hitting it on sweet. If I'm trying to hit the liver, I'm hitting it on bitter. You know, if I'm trying to hit like um, the, you know, like the kidneys, I'm hitting it on salty. If I'm trying to hit the lungs, I'm hitting it on spicy. You know, if I'm trying to hit the heart, I'm hitting it on sour. So, so like, what is that, you know, and what, what are those, what is that way of penetrating um, the, the energetics of the body system, right? So um, yeah, that, that's, that's another way is with flavors and different organ systems. Uh, and I would say for kidneys too, are you using a lot of diuretic herbs, you know, um, for liver, are you using a lot of those bitter um, type herbs? If you want to hit the lungs, Think of a tincture that is spicy, just right, like like so naturally intuitive. It's not hard. It's not it's not like you have to even go to herb school to figure out that your lungs are affected by spice. <laughs> you know, like right. So a lot of the best herbs, like the elecampane, um, has got a bit of spice to it. In that sense, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, Denise got a. Uh... Fantastic herbal brew here. Oh yeah, He's well, okay. Dying to fill his his cup with. And I want to hit all of Malcolm's herbal meridians. I want to hit all <laughs> your meridians, Malcolm. All so right. prepare yourself. All right. You just need Shazandra. <laughs> no, no. It's, so this no. is all wild. So we we can go, we can go one herb, or we can go forty-seven. Forty-seven herbs in your That's drink, Malcolm. Yeah, it's. Wow, how many herbs? Did you harvest that with a lawnmower? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it is got lungwort. 37. Lungwort. So like the lichen, five herbs in lichens? It. Lichen in it? Okay. I'm gonna get you a bottle, Yero. We're gonna get you some, but yeah, okay. it's good. 45 herbs. That's the official number. Uh, it it's one of the benefits of fermentation that you can. I do this every year. I use up all the herbs I've dried, like from the previous year. So they don't go to waste, but yes, it turned out super clear and super boozy. It's like a super good. Uh, all right. We'll send you a, we'll send you some of this one, Yero. It's a, it's a good one. Wow, what a, what an aroma. That's for sure. Yeah, a lot of wild herbs going on there. Um, definitely some sage and... Whew. We're hitting some organs here. Like, Malcolm. This is a full body tonic. This yeah, one. this bottle, I give it to you and I want to touch your liver with it. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> all right it's funny but it's true as a herbalist you touch people in their different organs it's like oh you need help down there okay let me touch let me touch you there with a special herb <laughs> oh yeah so you know maybe, maybe <laughs> share with us some of the uh yeah tell us what's in this what are, what are a couple of these herbs that you harvested with your lawnmower I mean, no, just <laughs> you got your list over there. Yeah, what do you taste, Malcolm, first off? What do you taste in there, Malcolm? It's got 45 different herbs in it. Okay. We have a bottle. Yes, I could, guess. I could guess about a bunch because you harvest it in Alberta, so I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's got to be yarrow. There's got to be, you know, very Juniper, some Uva Ursi, some nettles, yeah. some probably some yeah. poplar buds even or something. Yeah, <laughs> there sure is. <laughs> that's my list wow i wish your screen was cleaner i don't think anyone else can see this either but yeah oh there we go a few okay. you got pine needles you got you got a right pine resin violets, right pine pollen poplar buds juniper berries alfalfa yeah pops, wormwood. oak leaves arrow leaf colt's foot tansy wild mint nettle skull cap Palmate leaf, colt's foot, bunchberry leaf, Labrador tea, European colt's foot, twin flower leaf, raspberry leaf, curly dock, fireweed leaf, lungwort leaf, and flowers, wormwood, Russian tarragon, hops, alfalfa, freckle pelt lichen, usnea lichen, silverberry, violet leaf, 
blueberry leaf, wintergreen, uva ursi, cow parsnip seed, club moss, lovage flowers, silver leaf, buffalo berry, red osher dogwood, red clover, prince's pine, plantain, cranberry leaf, mountain heather, sea buckthorn leaf, and wild lettuce. And a whole <laughs> bunch leaf. more. And a whole bunch more. That's, that's, so, that's amazing. I just have to say that like, I am sure that your connection to the plants and to like actually crafting that up is so much of the medicine there. There's so much magic in the time you spent like harvesting all of that, you know, that in itself. And something else that I want to just mention before anything else gets said about it is that like, you've also got all these herbs that not every one of them is totally edible, but none of them are poisonous and all of them are health enhancing. So like, how do you actually get these herbs into you? Just, yeah, that's great. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Well, do you, do you have a do you have a mead to top that one, Yaro? Any any kind of brews that you've done that are uh... well? I'm a little bit, you know, honestly, like I'm a little more of a flavor snob. <laughs> I like things it's that marry well though, together. <laughs> I'm sure it's There's really good. Bad me, it's flavor. I'm sure it's amazing. And I, I I what I'm saying by that is that like when I when I make something that's like oh just so good, it's because it's married certain amount of like of of um, tannin with sweetness with aromatics so like dude you're gonna, missing out on i know right out. this is the perfect marriage i'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely something missing mm. and I, it's it's a topic i wanted to silver leaf buffalo approach. berry did that get in there there's no silver buffalo berry that's it. That's the one. <laughs> or is there? <laughs> yeah, there might be. So I wanted to approach you, Yero, about psychoactivity and hallucinogenic meads mm. and like how certain plants, certain plants are very inert by themselves. If you drank a tea of Yero, you wouldn't mm -hmm. be Hi, but if you drank a mead of yarrow, all of a sudden you're yeah enhanced. Yeah, like I mean, similar to the wormwood and the absinthe, right? Like that kind of plays into that story. This is why I like um, like I like I make one called lucidity, and it's the mugwort, and the mugwort is a big part of that. Um, slightly enhancing and really like affect the nervous system in that way. I love adding uh, herbs that are going to really affect the nervous system. Even, even like the shells of the cacao, not the cacao itself, but the hulls of the cacao are something I would put into a mead, right? I'd put it into a tea. I don't know if you ever had cacao hull tea. Malcolm, you ever had cacao hull tea? Yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. flavorful. What a beautiful one that I would add in as a part of a, um, you know, enhancer. So then you may want to add in some MAO inhibitor herbs. So you're looking at your ruse and you're looking at your passion flower and your cacao, right? To add, to enhance some of those psychoactive herbs that you might add in. Now I'm not going to prescribe to making um, reindeer urine pee. I mean, tea. <laughs> but, Did you say um, <laughs> yarrow urine pee? Right? Ooh. The amanita. Yeah. An, an amanita was, <laughs> Like, I mean, it's one of the ways to decarboxylate it is to actually ferment yeah. it, right? It's not just, so you dry it, you heat, high heat dry it, you do, you um, then make it into a tea and then ferment it even further. And you can get a more lucid version of an Amanita um, mushroom high without so much of this, the digestive troubles. And this is okay, one of I want to take a step back here, just a <laughs> one step back. Talk about mugwort. We mentioned mugwort, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a very strong dreaming herb, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's one of the herbs that when you mix it with alcohol, it has a more pronounced effect. And I, I would say, so the other thing too, is some herbs are too strong on their own. Mugwort is too strong, personally. It's got too strong of a flavor. It's got a very beautiful bouquet. Um, there's a nice 
um, flowery note that comes in mugwort, but it is in that Artemisia family, you know, and it is strong. So it sits in that wormwood seat of like, like the absinthe would sit, but it's nice to be offset with some other herbs that are going to support it and maybe more nutrify that. So I don't love mugwort on its own. I would say I would add it in in one fifth of my formula. Maybe, you know, I wouldn't add to make a straight mugwort one. I would do like, I, yeah. It really brings us to the, that definition of mugwort and like mug wart means a herb. They, they added to the mug and I guess it made your mug very glad. <laughs> yeah, mug wart. They right? added well, wart beer. means good, right? So um, in most of those. So what would you add to mugwort? I mean, I, I really love the Labrador tea sweet gale mugwort. That's a great one. That's just a beautiful one. I love a berry in there too, of some form. Always, I always add a berry, always if I can to any ferment, um, some form of berry. For me, it's whatever is local and easy and accessible. It's going to have tannins in the skin. It's going to have more antioxidants, uh, more of those phenols in the berries. So I always, you know, I, I did one one time that was that with um, uh, lychee nut or not with lychee nut with longanberry. That was really great. The longanberry had just a nice flavor to it. Um, but I would add cherry to that, or I would add um, some kind of like huckleberry that's going to have antioxidants to it. I would also add something to circulate it. So any kind of lucid aphrodisiac herb, I want to add a circulatory stimulant, um, hence a ginger or a spice of some form, right? Um, and you may add a digestive. So, um, yeah. So we're, we're already going past time here, Yero, but... Sure. We did want to talk with you about hallucinogenic, uh, psychoactive uh, herbs you could add to that, but well, oh, it sounds like maybe that's, that's a weird. different conversation. All right, we got to put our mugs away. I think we're going too far down the rabbit hole there. I, I uh, would say that yeah, that Sacred to... Healing Beers book is a good place to start for people who want uh, to learn about some of the psychoactive herbs. Uh, he talks about them. He definitely gets in there um, into the little more lucid, lucid dreaming herbs too, and some of the alcohol history. It, alcohol itself is a shamanic tool if used in the right way. I think that's something we learned today. If used in the right way, alcohol can be extremely beneficial. So. Uh, and it goes to ancient times. Like, this is evolutionarily part of us. All right, so I want to share, uh, let's get Denise's reaction uh, to this, this beverage. This one I want to share kind of a, an eclectic one. I, I, I wouldn't want to say this is a failed experience, uh, but it's definitely turned out completely different than I, I thought it was going to. So, you know, you might look at that and, and go, oh, okay. Maybe get a sense of, of what this might be, especially this <laughs> this season. <laughs> so, this here is uh, <laughs> it's a drink I wanted to cre recreate. Uh, there's, there's been some staff members that have made this each year, and uh, we do this gift exchange. And it's always like the prize, you know, possession of like ah, it's the highest gift that uh, you know is sought after. And so it's an aged eggnog, and uh, so I use raw cream, raw milk, raw egg yolks, uh, maple syrup, and then rum that was infused with, with some chaga. And uh, I made this back in, you know, late September. And so it's, it's been sitting and aging. And uh, so when I opened it up recently, you could not tell it was eggnog at all. Um, it's, 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 it's less aged and more fermented. Uh, so I find it's best not to tell people it's, it's eggnog at all uh, because it really doesn't taste like an eggnog. But uh, I'd, lo I'd love to see what uh, Denise thinks of it here. But one thing I can say for sure is that- Is it thick? It looks thick. <laughs> it's thick. I mean, this, <laughs> this would have been a damn good eggnog had it you know, succeeded in, in being that. But uh, oh. what it is now is like, wow, like 
the tropical fruit notes are off the charts. Yeah, and what herbs have you got? In pineapple there? Express. <laughs> it's Pineapple Express. Totally. What, yeah, what herbs are so traditional? The, so the only herbs in here is vanilla and nutmeg. Uh, but yet, you can't taste vanilla. You can't taste nutmeg. You taste pineapple. Uh, so let's let's see what Denise thinks. That's such a funny thing about sometimes fermentation, how it totally alters the flavors. Surprises. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, I wish it was there. <laughs> Tastes like yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's it what it tastes been, like yogurt. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what it's been described as so far. Anyone that I've offered it to that's been brave enough to try it. And, and I've realized I can't say it's aged eggnog. I have to say it's, it's a mystery drink. Let me know what you think. And uh, those that taste it with a blind, kind of just a palate ready to receive, go like, wow, that's amazing. Like tropical notes, like it's, it's uh, you know, guava, it's pineapple, it's passion fruit. Um, yeah, it's also been described as, as guac. Yup there. Uh, again, a fermented yogurt. So, so what do you think? Because you know, I was gifting Denis a bottle of this, and he says, "No, eggnog. I can't do it. Too many times, too many experiences, it's associated memory." Um, but well, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know about this milk. <laughs> 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 Oh, well. I'm sorry to say, but it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe that's a lesson for everyone that's listening. You know, don't ever feel bad that you've made something gross because <laughs> Malcolm and I, Yero, we've made this for 10 years now, longer. I've given it a lot of things to my garden. I have poured 20 liters of mead to my garden because it turned out gross. So don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. You know, it's a trial and error thing. Malcolm likes it. It's pretty good. <laughs> I think it's pretty good. I'm, Malcolm I'm is, is, is definitely in the winter months, likes his 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 butter and his eggs, <laughs> his <laughs> cultured yogurts. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it's just it's just all part of it. So no, it's great. Anyways, I, I, I love that. that. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, too bad we couldn't be all in person tonight, but uh, it was enjoyable anyways, using using technology to kind of connect and all our our homes and spaces being cozy and uh, just tuning in. So normally we would be naked in the sauna together doing this kind of conversation. Well, it's you, you know, got to join in. Part of our intention was to just set some merriment. Hopefully you guys had a laugh tonight. Maybe, you know, we're a little bit entertained and there's a lot more to this. We haven't gone deep into like the process of making mead fully, more trying to leave you with some brain and heart hooks onto like inspiration onto why you wanna start to journey down this path. There's so much resources out there. Like the internet is full of it. Remember, this is the age of recreation of originality of crafting your own culture this is not the age of information information is available and plentiful everywhere you look what do you want to do with it what do you want to create for us creating libations has been such a fun adventure to go down so we just want to hopefully impassion you empower you with some uh, reasons why you may want to take this journey for yourself and and the benefits of it are not just um the crafting which is a huge part of it the magic making but it's also the prebiotics it's also the herbal tonics it's also the enjoyment of community and allowing the muse to come through you in the drinks you make so just to like kind of leave you with this idea that um this is a, a road that if you so choose to go down um crafting your own beverages it's never ending it's like a library of the universe that you can just explore with the eyes of an innocent child as you, like like Denny, go and forge 
50,000 herbs and throw them into one bottle. <laughs> like, like how fun is that? I just, I just think, um, you know, there's so much uh, culturing to be done here and reculturing uh, to be created within this kind of fermentation experience within oneself. So I know that um, Malcolm and Denny do a lot of workshops on this and you guys have started to move to some online workshops now, right? So if you do want to know more about this and you do want to do this, um, I think they have a workshop coming up. So um, they can help you with a bit more of that. I'll pop it in the comments here. Um, the link says November 29th, but that's that's not true. Uh, it's actually the next one because I, I do it quite often. So January 21st, uh, well, not often, but once a quarter. So next one's coming up on January 21st. It'll be a mead making. Um, yeah, if, if you're in town and you want to be here in person, you know, just send me a direct message. Uh, otherwise, wherever you're tuning in from, uh, I'll show you, I'll walk you through the process. We'll cover a lot of, you know, what you already said, you know, the how to make. We kind of kept the conversation up here, not into the details of how to make. Yeah. Um, so this will really get you on the track, get you started uh, in, in getting into this, creating it. Brilliant. It's always one of the questions I ask myself. Hey, Malcolm, like, I'm going to try this. When did we forget to make booze? When did we forget as humanity how to make booze ourselves in the kitchen? You go to the Italian market, they didn't forget. You go to the, it's only our consumer culture that forgot. You go to other, other cultures of the world, they all know how to do it. Yeah, so this is- We forgot, and it's not long ago we forgot, but we have to remember how to do it again for our health, for our medicinal action of herbs, right? We want to make our herbs very powerful in the human body. We want to guarantee people take their herbs, right? We want to- hey, Middle finger? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, oh. <laughs> we want to make sure you take these herbs <laughs> yeah all right well all right well uh yeah we'll kind of bid you guys adieu for for this evening lots of fun thanks for tuning in and uh yeah it was good, good times Lo yeah. loved all the questions loved all the comments good conversation you didn't get to all your questions sorry about that no i still have more <laughs> i still have more too not just, okay, I've got one more question for you, Arrow. What do you think about the convenience of tinctures? Like when you put the herbs into alcohol, it's so convenient. Like you don't have to make a tea, you don't have to make a tea. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. You should make more tinctures. <laughs> All right. Hard, hard <laughs> the on. Um, uh, yeah, we want to we want to just also remember that like your time is your most valuable resource. We don't want to go too far over here. We could talk all night um, and we will probably again. Um, we really were hoping this was just kind of ad hoc, really fun, high level, the why and the, a little bit of the how and a little bit of inspiration. These guys are both legends. Both Malcolm and Denny have inspired me to really step up my mead making game. Um, and I just, I think that's another piece of this. And this, the last thing I'll say is like, bring your community into this experience with you. Bring a friend, uh, bring others with you along this road. It makes it, yeah, I see you too. You're like, yeah, we can bring each other. It's like, it makes it such an experience and such an empowering way. Like we're in a time where, like disassociation is all I can say about society. We are so disassociated from ourselves, from each other, from like this world. I mean, I see all of you and I've only ever seen all of you through these little pixels on my screen for so long now that I don't even remember what the physical you actually feels like. It's only a pixelated screen version of you that I see. So bring in your community in contact closely as you harvest, as you craft, go through the experience together. And this in itself 
is such a healing journey. And I just, I just hope um, that uh, as part of your journey to crafting up this type of medicine, uh, you invite those around you to be part of the experience in all your good times, bad times, and all of it. So yes. thanks for joining us. All right, cool, right on. Yeah, thanks everybody. We'll, uh, we'll say good night for now and we'll, we'll see you again soon. Keep in touch. Drink deep, drink to your heart's content. It is a old saying, you take your drink, you drink with your heart, not your mouth. <laughs> All right, Danny, I, you do have to send me a bottle of that. I will, I will happily uh, <laughs> enjoy it. Drink with your heart. Yeah. It's, it's your Can heart. Come, you gotta close it up. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> right. See you later. Thanks, Leo, Layla, Tessa, Debbie and Chad, Diabolique, love that, Cora, Bianca, Megan, Marissa, Sue, Zenia, Fiona. All right, peace and out for now.